pulmonary embolism. So the number one cause of this <clears throat> is a DVT. So let's review how our body develops blood clots. So this is a clot that has obstructed one or more branches of the pulmonary artery, <clears throat> either left or both uh, lungs. Uh, let's review varicose triad, which is not on this page. Right here. Okay, let's go to chapter 26. Okay, go to 26. Oh, it's a vascular. Okay, I forgot. So PE technically is a, <clears throat> a vascular problem. Okay, because it's a blood clot which uh, happens to be in a pulmonary vessel, pulmonary artery. So it technically has pulmonary symptoms. However, it's really a vascular problem. So that's why it's here. Duh. <clears throat> So our body um, makes uh, blood clots under three conditions. Collectively, they are known as the Virco triad. We form clots when we have venous stasis, this one. So any condition wherein blood does not move, it pools in one area of the body. It could be in the lower legs, it could be in the heart chambers, it could be in the upper parts of the body. <clears throat> it could be in the dependent areas in your sacrum. So anytime blood is not moving, is that clear? So usually it's in a venous uh, circulation where blood does not move because in arterial, of course, you have the heart pumping, but the problem is coming back. So in the venous circulation side, there could be a number of factors, including immobility, decreased mobility, or in the case of cardiovascular disorders, the uh, AFib or A-flutter, for instance, or any heart failure condition causing congestion inside the, inside the heart chambers <clears throat> leads to blood pooling. So that's venous stasis. So platelets gather around too long in one part of the body, they form a clot, correct? Second is endothelial damage. The endothelium referred to here is the blood vessel. So any injury to the blood vessel, so whether trauma, whether that trauma is from violent trauma or trauma from surgery, surgical incisions, okay? So those are all, imagine a, a surgery. So how many blood vessels did the surgeon injure? Thousands, right? So there, that, no wonder our post-op patients at high risk for blood clots. Okay, so that's why we institute DVT precautions for these patients, correct? Uh, we use heparin or other, we'll get to the interventions later. Finally, the third of the triad is altered coagulation. So this is in, examples of this is in cancer patients, patients who smoke, patients who take oral contraceptive pills or any other type of blood disorder that's under altered coagulation. So when I ask you on a test question, which of the following patients are at high risk for PE or DVT, which ones would you choose? Those who have decreased mobility, those who have sustained any trauma to blood vessels, or patients who are in chart 26-8, right here. So these are all the patients who have high risk for both DVT and PE. It'll be the same. Any questions? Okay, so we're still in the risk factors. <clears throat> so let's go now to, um, we know the risk factors and we know the pathophysiology, patient develops a blood clot, the blood clot lands in one or more branches of the pulmonary artery. <clears throat> now let's go to signs and symptoms. Eight. Dash eight. 
Uh, we'll skip the DBT part. You already finished DBT in message one. <clears throat> Let's go to the PE now, manifestations. Uh, preventions here. So uh, how do we prevent DBTs or PEs? We have pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic means. So pharmacologic, we use any anticoagulant, heparin or low molecular weight heparin or any other anticoagulant. And you said compression stockings, compression devices, early ambulation or exercises, correct? Can you include also hydration? Yes, yes because hydration helps with venostasis, right? DBT-PE are treated the same way. However, in the case of PE, it really depends on the, the category because there are three categories of PE. There's a low-risk PE, there's a submassive, and then finally a massive PE. So treatment will vary depending on the severity or category. Let's start with pharmacologic therapy. Once you are... <clears throat> diagnosed with a PE or DBT, do we still need to prevent it? They already have a blood clot. Yeah. Yes, because doesn't mean they have one, doesn't mean, oh, I already got one. I'm immune. No, they have the risks, so therefore you continue with the same interventions to, to prevent them. So it includes ambulation, et cetera. We'll discuss the uh, drug therapy shortly. <clears throat> if the blood clot is too big for anticoagulants or too risky for thrombolytics, we do have the surgical option. So we can do thrombectomy. A doctor or surgeon, vascular surgeon can literally <clears throat> surgically remove the blood clot if it's that big. Since um, PEs can start as a DVT, so we have here the uh, review again for signs and symptoms of a DVT. DVT, do they affect both legs? Typically? No, it's always unilateral, right? <clears throat> okay, so you'll be extremely unlucky if you have DVT in both legs. Typically, it will only affect one leg. So there'll be unilateral leg swelling, <clears throat> not the thigh, but it's the lower leg. Okay. And there will be swelling of that affected extremity. So you can compare both legs. Obviously, one leg will be bigger than the other. Depending on the vessel, the vein affected, if it's a superficial vein, then you'll see that vein hard, red, swollen, painful. Or if it's deeper, then the only thing you see is a uh, patient will complain of tenderness and, of course, the unilateral leg swelling. Do we still do the Holman sign? DVT? Do we still re uh, yeah. use the D Holman sign? Yeah. What does the statement say? It's not reliable. So do we bother with it? Yeah. No. Holman sign don't even bother because it's not reliable. Okay. Right now, I have the Holman sign. My calves hurt when I dorsiflex. Does that mean I have a DBT? No. no. It's red. Well, there's no unilateral leg swelling, so I don't. Because anticoagulation is used to both prevent and treat uh, DBTs and PEs, uh, depending again on the category, so what's the why do we go do anticoagulants when the patient has a blood clot, either DBT or a PE? Why anticoagulant? What will the anticoagulant do to the blood clot? Okay, it will do nothing to the existing clot. It will, however, because you're putting them on an anticoagulant, will that existing clot get any bigger? No, it will keep it the same size. <clears throat> allowing the body to do its job, which is to dissolve that clot naturally. Until then, the patient stays on the anticoagulant. 
So the doctor decides how long the patient will be on anticoagulant to prevent new clots from forming. And again, preventing the progression of the existing clot. Depending on the anticoagulant use, so when do we use APTT? When do we monitor it? When, what is used? Heparin. When do we monitor PTINR? Okay. And of course, we watch them for bleeding. Anyone on anticoagulants, antithrombics, or especially thrombolytics. We already talked about thrombolytics in stroke. <clears throat> now, patients who have massive PE, they are hemodynamically unstable. They go into cardiac arrest. Those are the patients that receive thrombolytics. Are we clear? Okay, so only those patients will receive thrombolytics, meaning they are obviously hemodynamically unstable. We have to dissolve the clot right away because they are in cardiac arrest. In addition to that, what is the other? what are the other treatments? They are in cardiac arrest, so it will also involve CPR and full ACLS. Are we clear? Okay. But to treat the PE itself, patient will receive the thrombolytic, which is alteplase. Different dose than stroke. Okay. <clears throat> so here you have reducing discomfort. Could be if it's a DBT, then you position the elevate the leg that will help promote venous return, reduce the swelling. <clears throat> And don't put any, you know, uh, don't massage that leg. You should know that already. What about ambulation? They have an existing DBT. Should they ambulate? Mm -hmm. If they don't ambulate, what will happen? They'll get more blood clots. So what do we do now? Okay, there's a difference between massaging and ambulating. We do not massage. However, can the patient ambulate? Yes. yes. However, they should be on anticoagulants yes. before ambulation. Are we clear? Mm -hmm. There's really no evidence that ambulation causes a DBT to become a PE. Are we clear? There is no evidence. However, before ambulation, the patient must be on Anticoagulants. So as long as you have anticoagulants, ambulation is actually desired. What will limit the ambulation, however, is the pain because the leg is painful. Okay, But there's really no contraindication to ambulation. Are we clear? We actually, in fact, uh, if the patient is <laughs> comfortable enough, walk. Okay, Please walk. Don't worry about getting a PE. Okay, there's really very little, little evidence that shows, yeah, as long as you don't massage that leg, of course, massaging is different than ambulating. <clears throat> so we know elevation to elevate above the heart. So here, early ambulation. So do not be afraid. Are we clear? <laughs> Clearly, the book says, ambulate. Okay. This is not just part of the prevention. This is to part of management of DBT and PE. All right, let's go to the anticoagulants. Now, as far as the anticoagulants is concerned, can we send the patient home on heparin? No. no. Okay, so to understand why the patient is placed on what anticoagulant, let's look at how they work. Heparin works by binding to antithrombin. Therefore, it prevents <coughs> nucleus from forming. It's a thrombin inhibitor. That's why it's called a antithrombin. Maybe I should show you a okay short video on the clotting cascade. I think I showed you this at some point. Yes, no. Okay. 
So just type in Cloud and Cascade on YouTube. At the site of vessel injury, the first platelets arrived to start sealing the wound. Simultaneously, the coagulation cascade with its various coagulation factors is activated. This involves two pathways. Okay, so what you're looking at is a injured blood vessel. So this is endothelial injury. So it's cut, somebody sliced this patient, pricked their finger, whatever. Platelets immediately stuck to the injured endothelium. So this is the extrinsic pathway. This is not really a clot. This is a platelet plug. This is not a clot that is formed. This is simply a temporary patch, call it a band-aid, to stop the bleeding momentarily. The extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway. Extrinsic activation begins with now exposed molecules of the vessel wall, such as tissue factor, Tissue factor will help activate more platelets. Uh, so if you remember in cancer, patients with cancer that are high risk for clots, right? So this is the reason because cancer cells produce and activate tissue factor in the absence of vessel injury, meaning the patient didn't suffer any endothelial injury, but because the cancer cells produce tissue factor, so it promotes clot formation. So the extrinsic pathway just takes not even two seconds. If you remember getting a cut, paper cut, for instance, does it bleed? It bleeds right away, but does it continue bleeding or does it stop momentarily? It stops momentarily. However, after a few moments, wherein, especially if you wash your hands, does it bleed again? Yes, because there's no clot formed yet. It takes a few more minutes. So let's continue and see how a clot, a permanent clot is eventually uh, formed. Which forms a complex with factor seven. Finally leading to the activation of factor 10. Okay, so the factors they're talking about here are the clotting factors. Okay, so they're activated in the chain reaction, uh, which will eventually lead to fibrin uh, formation, which is a clot. A fibrin clot is what we want to form. <laughs> This factor 10A is the point at which the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways of the coagulation cascade meet. The intrinsic pathway consists of various coagulation factors activating each other in a chain reaction. At its end, a complex with an additional cofactor is formed. This complex now activates factor 10. So we have anticoagulants known as factor 10A inhibitors. <clears throat> so these are rivaroxaban, uh, apixaban, okay, Zarelto, Eliquis. So those are called 10A inhibitors. So they stop this portion of the clot formation. So therefore, if you give a patient a 10A inhibitor, will it continue the clot formation? No, because it stops right here, because it stops 10A from being activated. You can't form factor 10A when you take, take the 10A inhibitor, so therefore, do you form blood clots? Impossible, because you stop the 10A formation. <clears throat> so that's how 10A inhibitors work. So they're earlier in the cascade. Since the two pathways merge at the level of factor 10A, this factor has a pivotal role in the coagulation cascade. Further down the cascade, factor 10A, in combination with 5A, activates thrombin and induces the so-called thrombin burst. So this is where heparin comes in. <clears throat> so heparin will prevent this thing from happening. One molecule of factor 10A can catalyze the formation of a thousand molecules of thrombin. So once the patient receives heparin, this whole thing here, will not happen. So no thrombin activated. Can you catalyze and form fibrin? No more fibrin. So the patient will never get a blood clot. You need fibrin in order to form a stable blood clot. These large amounts of thrombin cause the further activation of platelets and the enhanced formation of fibrin. 
fibrin then forms strands, making up the mesh that stabilizes the platelet plug in an arterial part and holds together the red blood cells in a venous clot. There's a blood clot. <clears throat> so that's how uh, our body forms a blood clot. So you have different types of anticoagulants stopping the cascade at various points. So we have 10 a inhibitors, we have uh, direct thrombin inhibitors, we have indirect thrombin inhibitors, all affecting different parts of the cascade. Now, warfarin was never mentioned in the video, correct? Because warfarin is a vitamin K inhibitor. Now, what is the role of vitamin K in our body? Why do we give it to newborns? We need them to form four types of clotting factors. Now, if you remember at some point in the in the video, they talked about 7A, 7A 8A, yeah. right there when they're activated. So those are the vitamin K dependent clotting factors. So if no vitamin K is synthesized by the liver because you're giving warfarin, can you make those, those clotting factors? Can you make them without vitamin K? No. no. So that's where warfarin comes in. So you give warfarin, no more vitamin K. Can you make more of those clotting factors? No. However, I said you can't make them anymore. However, before you took warfarin, were there clotting factors already in the plasma? Yes. So that's why when we <clears throat> move on to the sequence of the therapy, so the patient will receive heparin first because heparin will give you immediate anticoagulation because it will interrupt the thrombin formation. However, can you send the patient home on heparin? No, we have to send them home on an oral anticoagulant. So if the patient has, let's say, <clears throat> the clot is caused by a valve problem, for instance, in which case our only option is warfarin. <clears throat> so the sequence will be patients placed on heparin, infusion, continuous infusion, uh, with the bolus, of course. And then on the same day, <clears throat> they will be placed on warfarin. Why two anticoagulants at the same time? Because warfarin takes longer. Exactly. So this will only affect today and moving forward, no more clotting factor formation. Those four clotting factors stop being produced. However, remember, there are clotting factors already circulating. Warfarin can affect those who are already in the serum. Okay, So we have to wait it out until the kidneys eliminate those existing clotting factors. So that's why there's a overlap. So patients for a few days, three, five, seven days, will be on heparin and warfarin at the same time. Right, so now we monitor the PTINR and the PTT, of course, constantly during these days until such time that the patient's INR goal, so let's say it's a PE, it's PE, our goal is always two to three INR. If it's a DBT, 1.5 to two is good, but PE should be two to three. Even higher if we have a recurrent PE. Let's say a patient had a PE before, now we want it three to four. Okay, even higher, three to 3.5 or some doctors will say three to four. Okay, so you understand the reason why there's an overlap? Any question? Of course, if the patient has, let's say a non-valvular uh, AFib, they can get away with just these drugs here which is more fast acting, no diet restrictions, and even no blood monitoring. Yeah, so we use these uh, over, or these for instance, direct oral 10A inhibitors. Okay, so these things have no blood monitoring. So only heparin and warfarin are, are hassles, okay, because they need blood monitoring okay. constantly. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, they're covered by insurance. Uh, these things, Eliquis, Apixaban is very cheap, covered by most insurance. Yeah, but with insurance, it's, it's free. Maybe you'll have 10 bucks. 
Oh uh, yeah, you're screwed either way if you have no insurance. I mean, there's nothing we can do with that. But if you have insurance, you'll be okay. Right? Now let's uh, discuss the um, this one uh, really briefly. If the doctor puts the patient on low molecular weight heparin, this is based on the patient's weight. Unlike this heparin, which is based on the patient's PTT. Again, the dose of the heparin, unfractionated heparin, is based on the patient's PTT, bleeding time. Unf uh, I mean, low molecular weight heparin is based on the dose. So therefore, let me ask you, do we need to monitor the patient's PTT while on heparin, unfractionated heparin? Yes. yes, because the dosing is based on the PTT. PTT is too high. What do we do with the dose? Decrease it. PTT is too low. Increase. PTT is within therapeutic range. No change. However, this one is based on the weight. Now, does your weight change drastically from one week to another? No. So therefore, do we bother monitoring the PTT? Only if the patient has some drastic weight change. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's why the patients, if appropriate, okay, again, we nurses do not decide, doctors decide on what anticoagulant to use. However, because it's our job to monitor PTT, PTINR, depending on the anticoagulant use, do we need to monitor PTT on this one? Why not? Because this is dose based on the weight. Again, only if there's a drastic change. Let's say the patient loses or gains 20 pounds. Okay? Yeah, but I mean, that doesn't happen, right? So therefore, we, we typically send them home on low molecular weight heparin. No need to monitor because again, the dose will not change unless there's a drastic uh, change in the weight. Are we clear? And remember these, when are these given again? These are still direct thrombin inhibitors, like heparin, which is, what do we call that issue? You presented this last week, uh, last semester, HIT. So if you have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, there, there you're placed on. These are the options, argatrobin, lepirudin. And again, this is only given for massive PE, okay? a really serious uh, type of PE, uh, massive, wherein the patient is hemodynamically unstable, meaning the blood pressure is very low, patients in cardiac arrest. Okay? So in addition to ACLS, patient will also receive alteplase. Here are your teachings for patients taking anticoagulants. I mean, this is a repeat of last semester, you know, bleeding precautions, basically. Uh, either prevent bleeding or watch for early signs and symptoms of bleeding. All right, let's continue next week. Thank you.